Hi there, Sandra here from Creating Spain with yet some more crafty hints and tips. My first one is about brushes. I've got brushes that I've had for many years and it is very rare that I actually throw a brush away. I might throw the odd cheapy one away because I'm fed up with it, but when it comes to proper brushes, no, I don't throw them away. First of all, how do you generally look after your brushes? Well, as most people know, it's not a good idea to keep your brushes soaking in anything for a long period of time. And you definitely don't want to do what you did in school, and that's put them face down in a jar and leave them there for days on end. No, definitely don't want to do that. The best thing you can do for your brushes is to clean them after you've finished using them. And I do understand that sometimes things get in the way and you don't do it. For normal, everyday cleaning, it's quite simple. Soap, water, dry. If you have ruined a brush, however, there's no need to throw it out because quite often you can actually rescue it. One of the things that we ladies frequently have on hand is nail polish remover or acetone. Now, I would not normally recommend cleaning your brushes in nail polish remover or acetone, but if you wrecked it anyway, then you might as well give it a go. So what you do is you get yourself a very small dish, like a candle holder or something like that, and you put a tiny amount of acetone in it. You do want to make sure it's probably glass because sometimes acetone will eat through the plastic and it might make quite a mess. You want to then take your brush and literally press it into the acetone and try and loosen whatever is in it. Now, if it's acrylic paint or glue, the chances are acetone will free it for you eventually. If you find you take it out and it's still a little bit clumpy, take a normal dressmaking pin and gently go between the bristles. Quite often, as is with combing your hair, this will take out any knots and it will smooth things out considerably. Put it back in the acetone, rinse it around a bit more and see if that's done the job. If you think it's probably done what you needed it to do and freed everything up, now comes the next step. Rinse your brush in warm, soapy water. You can use shampoo for this. It is fine because these are made largely from hair and shampoo will clean it nicely, especially if the paint has been loosened already or the glue, whatever. So you want to really give it a good clean and then you want to check it again and see if it's clean enough. If not, rinse and repeat. Once you have your brush nice and clean, and it usually doesn't take very long, what you want to do is to rinse it off and then you want to actually put some hair conditioner on it. Yeah, hair conditioner. It'll be wonderful. Just a little dab on your hand, put the brush in it and shape it to a point as required or if it's a flat brush, make it flat. Allow it to stay that way overnight and then when you go to use it the following day, your brush should be fine. You just need to make sure you rinse it off first. If you're going to be storing your brushes for any length of time, then I suggest that you use a hair gel on the brush head after you've done your conditioning, and this will keep it in position and stop the bristles from poking out. And it's like training. Those bristles learn the shape, and you'll find when you go to use your brush the next time, it's a lot better. Now, if you have really, really wrecked a brush and you've got splayed bristles, again, don't give up. This one here was a cheapy brush, never was very good. And I decided that the best thing I could do with this was to use it as a rigger brush. Now, a rigger, if you're not familiar, is a very fine one that used to be used for painting riggers on boats, things like that. Not the actual boats, obviously, pictures of. So a rigger is used for fine lines. And so all you do is you separate out a few of the bristles and you take a sharp pair of scissors and you trim as close to the ferrule as you possibly can, leaving yourself with just a few. You now have a very, very fine detail brush that you can use for fine lines just when you need a very fine brush because to buy a really fine brush 
is usually quite expensive because it usually means you're going to have to buy an artist grade brush but now you won't have to. My second one, particularly around the Christmas season, keep a selection of gold, silver and white pens, pencils, whatever it is you like to use in one container. They're easy to find. You don't spend ages looking for the things and you will then quickly find out if one of them is running out of ink instead of thinking oh I've got another one there somewhere I don't know where it is and how much ink has it got in it if they're in the same place you'll realize whether you have a spare or not you won't buy extras that you don't need to buy and at the same time you won't run out of the colors that you really want talking of a color don't forget to have a stock of black card on hand now I know in general we don't use an awful lot of black as card makers but for the old snowy night scenes and things like that it really does come into its own. I've got a piece here which has been splattered with various acrylic paints. These paints are actually paints that change colour and they are really nice. Here I have a card where I've used a black background, various acrylic sparkly paints on it and then gone in with a white pen to add some snow. While on the subject of this I've also added a little bit of glitter to the tops of the buildings. Not enough to make it really noticeable but it will glow on there when artificial light gets on it and it will make the card that much extra special but it's not enough that it's going to put glitter everywhere when someone opens the card. It's just a tiny little touch. I forgot to mention, I have here a couple of pens. This is the Signo Uno gold pen that I've had for quite a while. I had this in gold, I had it in silver, and I loved both of them. The silver was always the better of the two. The gold one tends to separate. So you really do need to shake this one up before using, otherwise you'll find you get a kind of orangey look and it won't have as much sparkle in it. There must be something about the pigments settling. However, I went to replace my new, sorry, I went to replace my Signo White Uniball, my medium tip, and I could no longer get this type. I don't think the ink is quite as good and it is certainly not as comfortable. It is hexagonal rather than being round. It's supposed to have a comfort grip. It certainly doesn't feel comfortable for me to write with. If I was going to actually use it for writing, I'd want to put something around here. So I'm not a fan of that one any longer. If you can get the one that is in that shape barrel, then go for it because those were really nice. Although I have used glossy accents in the past, I loathe it because it takes so long to dry. If you have a UV lamp like this, then the chances are you have UV gel around and there is nothing to stop you from using a UV gel as a glossy accent. As long as you make sure that it's one that is a no white, you're really going to love it because it's going to be really, really quick. You can get the dimension you want, you can get the gloss you want, you can even get sparkly ones. Use up the colours that you don't like in your collection even. It just makes it so much easier. To do dots on paper and everything, I suggest you either use the wrong end of a brush handle or you use a nail dotting tool, which is one of these things. These things are really handy for all sorts of things. I use them for scoring. I use them for gels and things. I use them for glues quite often because it's not going to get messed up. And... If you use that with a gel for your accents, a minute or so under the lamp and you're done and you can package it up and send it off. Latex gloves. Not everyone can wear latex. I can, it's not a problem. But I do suggest you keep some kind of disposable glove in your craft room for the simple reason that if you're using alcohol inks, if you're using paints and dyes and colors, the chances are you are going to get it all over your hands. On a similar vein, 
I've actually got an apron in my craft room for when I'm using things where I like to use a splatter technique or something like that. The splatters splatter and they don't necessarily stick to what they are supposed to be splattering on. They can go everywhere. So, you know, unless you're wearing old clothes in the craft room, I frequently do, if you're doing anything messy like that, I suggest an apron. If you don't have an apron, don't rush out and buy one. I mean, you can make one if you want to, but if you don't have it, don't worry. Just borrow an old shirt from someone. You can wear it backwards like kids do in school, and it has the advantage of not only covering your front, but covering your sleeve as well. This next one is for Brother Scan and Cut users. I have some lines drawn on here just as an example. But what I suggest you do is that you make these lines and you make them into either FCMs or SVGs. If you can't draw them yourself, basically you don't have to draw a straight line, so it's not really a problem. But if you can't draw them yourself, the chances are you can find a line like this on Pixabay or something like that. And what I suggest you do is select three or four of them and then save them to your machine. Now, the reason for that is because quite a lot of scenic designs require either a gentle slope for snow or for a meadow or for a forest, something like that. And it's not that easy to create in the software on the fly. If you get some lines that you like and you save them onto your machine, you'll have them for when you actually need them. And because they are then in a vector format, you can shorten them, you can make them deeper, you can make them shallower, whatever. And for this card, for example, I didn't cut all of this. All I did was I cut a line. Then I decided how deep I wanted it and just use a paper trimmer to trim it to size. But it will save you a lot of time in trying to get one of the right size, the right depth, blah, blah, blah every time you want to design a card that has that particular thing in it. My last tip for today is about the photographic card. Photographic card has basically been abandoned by most people because we don't print photographs any longer. But if you have some that you need to dispose of, then think about doing a couple of different things with it. The first one is making your backgrounds with alcohol inks. Photographic card generally works quite well for that. I did make a video a while back on how to make transparent stickers with it. And the other thing I'm suggesting is you use it for making gift tags. If you make your tag shape, mirror it, and just erase the middle line joining the two, you have a gift tag that you can just fold in half and then you can use it any way you like. And obviously you can do your various designs on it before you fold it. But this size card is ideal for gift tags. One gift tag out of each piece of card. I've got loads of this stuff and it's the sort of thing that will generally hang around for years without you doing anything with it whatsoever. And then it gets thrown out. Well, instead of doing that, use it up. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you again soon. Take care now.